Hi everyone, thanks for joining me today. So today I'm finally going to talk about how I make the simulations of the wave equation you find on my channel. I've been meaning to do that for a while, but I kept postponing it because it took me a little bit of work to prepare this presentation and I was busy with other things, but finally here we are. So let me start with a few examples. So actually the most successful simulation on my channel is a simulation of parabolic reflectors. So here I'm showing another version with a different color code, which I, I like more. So what we have here is a point source at the left here, which is emitting circular waves like now. And we have two parabolic reflectors. So the signal emitted by the wave is propagating in all directions and it will lose energy uh, because the energy is dispersed on a larger region. So if you want to detect that signal with a receiver which is far away, uh, the signal will be quite faint. However, in this situation part of the wave is reflected on the left-hand parabolic reflector and the source has been placed on the focal point of the parabola. And the parabola has the property of transforming a circular wave into a linear wave. And this linear wave can propagate for a very long distance without losing any energy. And that is why on the right-hand side, you see, for instance, now there's uh, the faint part of the non-reflectic uh, wave that has reach the, the receptor and now it's the part that comes from uh, the left hand reflector and that one has a much larger energy. So here is a three-dimensional render of a similar situation. So the wave equation here has been solved in two dimensions and I use the third dimension to represent the height of the wave. So again we have here a pulse, a wave that has been emitted at the focal point of the left-hand parabolic reflector. And now you see first the non-reflected part propagating and it's going to hit the right-hand reflector right now. And so it is going to be concentrated to some extent and we are going to see now a, a little pulse of concentrated wave height, but now the linear part has been reflected and turned into a circular wave and you see that it gives a much larger peak. And we can see the same in the energy representation, so now instead of the wave height the z-coordinate shows the energy of the wave and here you see better that the non-reflected part loses energy or the density of the energy decreases and it's going to be reflected on the right hand side now. And you see that it is concentrated uh, to some extent near the focal point. But now the reflected part, the linear part, is reflected and transformed into a circular wave and it gives a much larger energy. So this is how satellite dishes work and uh, actually can work on very large distances like between a satellite, satellite and geostationary orbit and the surface of the Earth with quite little loss of power. So let me now explain how you can derive the wave equation and there are several ways of doing it. Uh, this is the one I believe is the simplest. So let us look at a chain of coupled masses. The masses are coupled by springs and I start with a situation where all springs are at rest. So the length of the springs at rest is called L0 and I've just put all the masses on a line uh, 
separated by the distance L0. So there's no force acting on any of the masses. And now let me displace the masses a little bit. So UI measures the displacement of the ith mass with the convention that UI is positive if the mass is moved to the right and negative if it's moved to the left. So for instance here U1 will be positive, U2 will be negative. And I can now compute the new length of the swings. So the length of the ith spring is given by this formula L0 plus UI plus 1 minus UI. And we've taken care of the signs in this expression. So for instance, if UI plus 1 and UI are the same, the length of the spring doesn't change because the particles have moved the same distance in the same direction. But if, uh, for instance, UI plus 1 is positive and UI is negative, then the spring has become longer. Now, given this length of the spring, I can compute the force of the force acting on the ith particle. So it has two terms coming from the left and the right spring. And it's given by k times the elongation of the right spring minus the elongation of the left spring. Now, by Newton's law, the acceleration of the ith particle will be given by this expression. So it's 1 over the mass of the particle times this uh, force, which I have uh, simplified a little bit here. And now the idea is that we are looking at situations where there's a very large number of masses and they are close to each other. So perhaps the total length of my system is one meter and I have a thousand masses. So the separation at rest will be one millimeter. And I'm going to look for a function u of time and space that interpolates the ui at time t. So I'm going to assume that u at time t and position i times delta x, so the ith lattice point, is given by this ui of t. Now I replace this in my formula, so this ui plus 1 minus 2 ui plus ui minus 1. I first replaced this in terms of the interpolation function u. And then I make the observation that if I write this again as u of t i plus 1 delta x minus u of t i delta x, by Taylor's formula that will be close to delta x times the space derivative of u at the midpoint. And then I'm left with another minus u plus u at the lattice point i minus 1 delta x, which I can again approximate by a derivative. And now I have a difference of derivatives at nearby points, which I can again approximate by now another factor delta x, so I get delta x squared here, times the second derivative at the lattice point. So the conclusion of this is that the second time derivative of u at time t point x should be equal to some constant times the second space derivative. And the constant, I've written it as c square. We will see why in a minute. So the co this constant is delta x square times k over n. So I'm going to assume here that the so delta x is quite small and actually the spring constant will be quite large. And you can also check that this c has uh, the dimension of uh, velocity. So you can measure it in meters per second. So this is the one-dimensional wave equation. Now let us look at a few cases where this equation can be solved explicitly. So here I'm assuming that my chain of particles is actually infinitely long. And to find a, a solution, uh, a unique solution, I have to, to give some extra information. So here I have specified the positions at time 
zero. But since it's a second order equation, I also have to impose the velocity at time zero. So it would be the same for the spring. So I have to say how I've displaced each spring and what velocity it has to uh, have a well-defined equation. Now, the first observation here, and we made something similar for the heat equation a while back, is that this is a linear equation. So uh, it satisfies the superposition principle, meaning that the sum of two solutions is again a solution. So we can start looking for particular solutions. And here's an example. I could look because we expect waves to be uh, oscillating uh, functions, a little bit like uh, sines or cosines. So let us try uh, u of tx, which is of the form cosine of kx minus omega t. Then if I take the second time derivative, I will get minus omega square times the same cosine. And if I take the second space derivative, I will get minus k square times this cosine. And so you see that if omega square is equal to c square times k square, then I will have a solution. And this means that omega should be equal to plus or minus c times k. Now such a solution is called a traveling wave because you see if I look for instance at uh, where it is maximal, where it has value 1, so for instance it will be when kx is equal to omega t, so x is equal to omega over kt, so it will be a point that moves at constant speed. And the speed is uh, actually equal to c or minus c. So if it's equal to c, we're, we will have a wave traveling to the right. If it's equal to minus c, we will have a wave traveling to the left. But actually, Fourier analysis tells us that we can take any superposition of so such uh, cosines and also sines. And with that, uh, we can construct a lot of different functions. And actually, any smooth, smooth function of x plus ct and x minus ct will be a solution. And <clears throat> you can ex actually express this in a general form, that's due to d'Alembert, in terms of my initial data u0 and v0. So you can check that this expression here is the solution of my equation up there. So first of all, it is indeed a function of x plus ct and x minus ct. And you can also check the initial values. So for instance, if t is equal to 0, the integral here vanishes. And I get 1 half times twice u0 of x, which is indeed u0 of x. And you can check that the time derivative at time 0 is also equal to v0 of x, as it should. So that was for the wave equation on the infinite real line. But in practice, we typically have the wave equation on some finite interval. So let's say I have an interval 0L. So here's my equation again with the initial values for position and velocity. And in addition, I'm going to impose now that u vanishes at point 0 and at point L. So in the spring system, it would correspond to a situation where the leftmost and rightmost mass are just fixed. They cannot move. So here, uh, a useful trick to solve this equation is called separation of variables. So what I can do is look for a solution which is a function of t times a function of x. So if I plug this into the wave equation, I get this. f second times g is equal to c square f times g second. And now the, the trick is to divide everything by f of t times g of x times c square. 
So I get this relation here. And the point is that one part depends only on t and the other only on x. So actually these ratios cannot depend on t or on x. So that equal to some constant and let me call it minus lambda. And then I have actually two equations to solve. So one equation is this equation g second is minus lambda g. And if I take my boundary conditions into account, so g has to be zero at point zero and l, I find a family of solutions g n of x, which are sides. Signs with a spatial frequency n pi over l, and n is any strictly positive integer. And that satisfies this equation with lambda given by n square pi square over l square. And then I can look at the equation for f, and that one I, I can also solve. And in general, the solution will be a linear combination of a cosine and a sine with some coefficients a n and b n. So the general solution is what we call a superposition of standing waves. So it's a sum over all positive integers n of fn times gn. And each term in the sum is called a standing wave because if at some point, for instance, uh, the sign is zero, so there's no oscillation at that point, and it will always remain zero. So for instance, for n equal two, the midpoint here of my chain will not uh, move at all. Now in general, the coefficients a n and b n here have to be determined in terms of the initial data u naught and v naught. And Fourier analysis gives us a way of doing that. So this situation you can use, for instance, to model the motion of a spring of a musical instrument, like a violin or, or a piano. So you give the initial displacement and speed of the string, and then you can use this solution to find the evolution in time. So there's one more uh, important property of the wave equation, which is energy conservation. So let me look again at the wave equation with these boundary conditions. U has to be zero at point zero and L. The energy of my wave is given by the following expression. So it's an integral over my space interval and it involves two terms. So one is the density of kinetic energy. It's proportional to the time derivative squared. And the second term is the potential energy. It's proportional to the space derivative squared. And that is in the spring system we started from what will give the potential energy of my springs. Now let us look at the time derivative of this energy. So if the integral is well defined, I can, I can pass the time derivative inside the integral. And now I write a partial derivative because here the functions depend on time and space. And now I can use the chain rule to expand the derivative. So I, I have factors two that simplify with the one half and then I get time derivative of u times the second time derivative and for the second I get the space derivative and the mixed time and space derivative here. And now what I want to do is integration by parts. So I actually want to, uh, to integrate by parts this dtx here to to get uh, so that will give me a dtu and take the derivative of the dxu that will give me a dxxu here. Now when I do integration by parts I always have boundary terms 
but here the boundary terms are actually zero due to my boundary conditions here. So u and all its derivatives at space points z and l will always be zero. And now uh, I can factor out the dtu and what remains here in brackets is actually zero because of the wave equation. So I get zero and I conclude that the energy is constant at time. So this is useful uh, because it gives me some degree of stability of the equation. Since the energy is constant, the time and space derivatives cannot go too much. Or they can maybe grow locally, but the overall value uh, cannot go too much. So it also means that my equation cannot blow up. The solution cannot become infinity everywhere. There are a few variants of this one-dimensional wave equation one can look at. So I started with the models of springs that oscillate in the direction of the string. So it's a longitudinal oscillation. But I can also oscillate in uh, the perpendicular direction, so I can have a transverse oscillation. And you can do the same argument I did with the masses and springs. And you find that actually you got to get also the wave equation, just possibly the spring constants and therefore the wave speed are different. And that's also the case for a general solid, like in a, an instrument, like a xylophone or maybe tubular bells. So they will oscillate. They can oscillate transversally, but also uh, longitudinally and possibly with different oscillation frequencies. Another possibility you can look at is the wave equation with damping. So now I've added here this uh, red term, which is a, a damping term. And if you do that, the energy will decrease over time. And yet another possibility is this equation here of an elastic membrane. So that equation you get if the springs, in addition to be connected to each other, are also connected to some fixed points. So that gives you this uh, spring term here that will tend to uh, pull you back to uh, its equilibrium value, to, to zero. And actually, in some of the very first simulations of the wave equation I made, I, I used this equation here uh, by mistake. Actually, I, I was concerned about the stability of my numerical scheme, and I wanted to add a little bit of dissipation to avoid numerical blow up, but I forgot to put the time derivative. So I actually simulated this elastic membrane equation. Yet another possibility is that you take a wave speed that depends on the position. For instance, in simulations involving refraction, you can make this wave speed position dependent. So now let us come to the numerical simulation. Of course, in 1D, we know uh, many things about solutions, so we don't really have to simulate the equation, but this will become useful in two dimension. So the first point is just to discretize space and time. So I say that my time t is given by n times some small delta t, and space as before, x is given by i times uh, some small interval delta x, and the wave height at point n delta t i delta x I call u n i. And first I discretize my second space derivative, but this we have already done before. So I know that for small delta x I can approximate my second derivative by this expression here. So one of one over delta x squared times this linear combination, which is called a 
discrete second derivative or Laplacian. And then I can do the same for the time discretization. So what changes here is, so before I kept the time index n constant and I changed the space index, now I keep the space index i constant and I change the time index. And now I just replace this in the wave equation and I solve for u index n plus 1 i and I get the following expression here. So u n plus 1 i depends on u n but also u n minus 1 i and u n at uh, the neighboring lattice points. And here c, capital C, is a constant which is called the Courant number. number. And there is a, an important result from the theory of these systems, these uh, uh, numerical solutions, which is called the CFL condition for Courant, Friedrichs and, and Levy, that says that for this numerical scheme, the scheme will be stable, so you will have no numerical blow up if C is less than 1. There are other schemes that allow even for a bit larger C. But in my simulations, I typically take a smaller C or something like 0.1, maybe 0.2. And in this one-dimensional case, so you see what we have here is a little bit like a cellular automaton, except that it has a memory 2. So the value at time n plus 1 depends on the values at time n, but also n minus 1. But it's quite easy to code. I remember as a student I coded that actually on a, uh, on a spreadsheet. So you can use a spreadsheet and uh, put the initial values and then so for time n equals 0 and 1 and then you just use this formula here and you copy and paste down and you can solve the equation like that. Now let's see what changes in the two-dimensional case. Well, the main difference is that now I will look at the wave height at points x and y. So here we can assume that my oscillation is perpendicular to a plane described by x and y. And my spring system will now be a system where each mass is coupled to four neighbors. And if you do a very similar uh, argument as before, you will get this two-dimensional wave equation where I now have the second derivative in x and the second derivative in y at the right-hand side. And this is usually denoted by this Greek capital delta, and it's called the Laplacian acting on the function u. And you can again do the discretization and the result is almost the same. So the, the only difference is here in the square brackets where I have more terms. So now the, the value, the new value will depend on the four values at time n at the four neighbors. And here I have a minus four here that instead of a minus two. So let's look again at a couple of examples. So here, as I mentioned, one can easily simulate equations where the wave speed depends on the position. So in this situation, the wave speed is smaller in the lower half and larger in the upper half. And this allows us to simulate total internal re reflection where actually the waves are not able to exit the lower part depending on, on the angle with which they hit the interface. So you see there are some waveforms that hit the interface almost straight on and they are able to, to go into the upper half. But at some point 
the wave fronts kind of detach and you see that here the, the wave fronts are, are completely reflected. There's actually a very small region in which there is an exponential damping of the wave front. And here is another recent example, which is now a random wave speed. So the wave speed depends in a rather complicated random way on position. And you have this nice phenomenon called a branched flow, where the, the energy of the wave, which is so shown here, tends to split into several small filaments. Now, when simulating this equation, you also need to choose an initial state and boundary condition. So let me first talk quickly about the initial state. So since it's a time two uh, cellular automaton, we need to initialize uh, so the u i j at time zero and say minus one for all lattice points in our simulation lattice. Now, there are a lot of options here. So what I use most is either a circular wave, so starting at point x naught, y naught. And here what I usually take is something like this. So u at point x, y is given by some amplitude times an exponentially decreasing term, and it decreases like the distance to x naught, y naught squared over some parameter sigma squared, so it's Gaussian decay, and I superimpose uh, an oscillating term. And the idea here was, when I started doing this, I wanted to have something like what you see when you throw a stone into a surface of water and you see these uh, wings expanding, and I, I wanted to mimic this form of, of the wings. So, but it's not the only possibility are probably lots of other functions which are radially symmetric will give similar results. Another thing I use a lot is linear waves. So it's similar, but now I only take the distance from a line. So this will be a wave that uh, propagates in a given direction. Yet another option is to have an oscillating boundary. So this I used for some simulations uh, where I compare wave protections or simulations uh, with uh, lenses and so on, where I take a, a time. Okay, uh, the zero should, should be a t here. So a time periodic oscillation for the left hand uh, boundary. And I did a few simulations with a chirp. So again, the first argument here is time. And uh, a chirp is uh, an oscillation, but the oscillation frequency increases with time. Now, in all these cases, what I usually do is that I fix the u naught i j's according to this, this formula. and. I just put zero for the u minus one ij's because somehow I don't think it makes a big difference uh, because after a few iterations the system will stabilize. But uh, it might be possible to get something, some finer tuning by choosing the u minus one in a, in a better way. Now the other point we need to, to talk about is boundary conditions. So the easiest thing to do is called reflecting or Dirichlet boundary conditions. And let's say, for instance, we want to model the wave equation in a circle. So I have a circular domain and I want my wave to be reflected on the inside boundary of this circle. So here I have drawn my simulation grid. In practice, the grid is much finer than here. And what you do is, 
that first you define a table, which in my code is called xyn. So it's a table that gives to each pixel the value 1 if it's inside my domain and 0 otherwise. So it is a, a discrete approximation of my circle. So I have to choose somehow which points, which squares I consider to be inside the circle or not. But for very fine mesh, it shouldn't make a, a big difference. And then I set to zero the initial values for the wave outside the domain. And when simulating the equation by iterating this relation I've just shown you, I only update the wave values inside the domain. So the one, the one shaded in blue here. And in this way, automatically, you will get reflections on the boundary. So you don't need to worry at all about how to model what happens at the boundary, just by having the wave equal to zero outside, you will get reflections. So here is an example with an elliptic boundary, and here I started a circular wave on the focal point of this elliptic boundary. And you see this nice property of ellipses, which is that a wave starting from one focal point will be concentrated on the other focal point. Now there is some dispersion which may be due in part to uh, numerical errors, in particular to what happens near the boundaries, but nevertheless you, you see uh, that you have this concentration of energy at the focal points. So there's another case of boundary conditions uh, that I use quite a lot, and that is periodic boundary conditions. So periodic boundary conditions means wrap around, like in a computer games such as Pac-Man. So it means that the left and right border are glued together, and the top and bottom border are glued together. And so if I take a pixel which is somewhere in the bulk, so not close to the boundary, so like the red pixel here, it will have these four neighbors that enter my uh, iterative relation. But if my pixel is on one of the sides, it will still have four neighbors, but one neighbor will be on the opposite border. And if it's in a corner, it will again have four neighbors, but now two neighbors will be in other corners of, of my, my mesh. So actually the, the iteration you do is exactly the same, except that you have to take into account this different definition of neighbors when you compu compute the discretized Laplacian. Now another issue is uh, what is called absorbing boundary conditions, or PML for perfectly matched layer boundary conditions. So what often happens is that you have a situation where you want to model the wave equation in some domain, but you don't want the waves to be reflected on the boundary. You want the waves to exit the boundary. And that is actually not so easy, because if you just put the wave equal to zero, outside the boundary, you will get reflections. Now, you could, of course, argue that you can simulate the equation on a larger domain and only show what happens in part of the domain. But for one thing, it increases computation time. And the other thing is yeah, that you only postpone the problem. So your wave will be reflected a bit later, but it will uh, ultimately enter the shown region again. So what you want is some boundary condition that kind of absorbs the waves when they hit the boundary. And I give you a reference of, of an article where I found a way of doing this. 
And uh, the basic idea is that on the boundary of the domain, you want to impose a certain relation between the derivative of the wave in the normal direction and its time derivative. And so you can use this relation to change the value of uh, the time derivative that will give you this uh, time step for you on the boundary based on an approximation of this normal derivative. And I did it with my, in my simulations with just one layer, so I estimate this derivative just by comparing neighboring pixels, but you could in principle use more than one layer then it will slow down the computations a little bit, but it will give a better approximation of this absorbing effect. Now, there are a number of other boundary conditions you can use. So, for instance, you can mix boundary conditions. So, what was sometimes used uh, was periodic boundary conditions on top and bottom and absorbing or oscillating boundary conditions on the left and right borders. And that is uh, uh, useful, for instance, for these uh, wave protection simulations where you have uh, an oscillation generated on the left and then it, uh, it propagates to the right, but you want the linear wave not to be modified on top and bottom. So you use periodic conditions on top and bottom. Also for some of these mangrove simulations, I imposed the wave height on not just the left side, but also part of the top and bottom side to get the wave propagating in a certain direction, which is not horizontal. And one thing I did not do, because it would be a bit more tricky to implement, is Neumann boundary conditions. So Neumann boundary conditions you get if in the spring system you don't fix the leftmost and rightmost mass but you just keep them free. And that you can see will actually mean that the normal derivative of the wave at the boundaries will be zero and not the value of the wave. And that would actually be a good way to model real waves which are not you see the wave height is not uh, kept at zero at the boundaries, but it's more like the the wave can go up and down. It's the, the derivative of the wave that will be close to zero at the boundaries. But I didn't implement this because it's a bit more tricky if you change the shape of the domain. So lastly, let me talk a little bit on about computation time. So if you make a code simulating the wave equation, it will look a bit like this. So there's a first step where you initialize the fields. So the fields would be the wave height at time 0 and minus 1 for the initial condition, but also this table telling me which points are in the domain and which points are not in the domain. But also if I have a position dependent wave speed or and maybe also dissipation term and so on, all this I initialize once and for all at the beginning of the simulation. And then I have this time step. So the time step is this recurrence relation I showed you. So u at time n plus 1 and points i, j is a certain function of previous quantities. And actually in the simulation, since it's important to have a small time step, I usually do a certain number of time steps, I repeat this a certain number of times, before drawing and saving an image. And then I repeat this process a certain number of times, uh, which is the number of frames of my movie. So typically the, I started simulations with resolutions of 1280 times 720, but then at some point I increased to high resolution with a 
something like almost 2,000 times over 1,000. And quite a few simulations are also did with a finer mesh. And that is because sometimes you need really a higher res resolution to when you have small details in interference occurring. And so this means that for each time step, I have to compute my discretized Laplacian for several million points. And then the number of repetitions, typically I take something of the order of 10. And the number of steps with 25 frames by a second, uh, so for uh, one minute of movie, you need uh, 1,500 frames. So if you multiply all this, you see that you easily get several billions of floating point operations for one minute of video. So it is important if you want to make such a simulation to optimize things and the thing you should optimize foremost is the time step here. It's the inner loop of your simulation. Of course, it's also a good thing to optimize initialization and uh, drawing the image, but this is not as important as optimizing the inner loop, the time step here. And when I started doing this, I didn't have a lot of experience and I did some stupid things. And uh, luckily, uh, several helpful people told me tricks how to optimize this. So for instance, here is what I wrote in one of the early versions of the code for the innermost time step. So here nx and ny are the number of points in the x and y direction. So I make a double loop over i and j. And then what I did is, depending on the boundary conditions, I defined the coordinates of the neighbors. So, for instance, uh, for Dirichlet boundary conditions, so absorbing, uh, reflecting boundary conditions, I said that i plus is i plus 1, but uh, if I get out of my domain, I, I reset to uh, the, the rightmost point and so on. And I haven't written it here, but for our periodic boundary conditions, I would write that if i plus is an x, then I set i plus to zero. And then I compute the, the discretized Laplacian here. And then I do my time step here. This is actually not a clever way of doing things because I have a lot of if statements here. And every if statement takes a little bit of computing time. And Actually, here I, I don't need to do this because in most cases, uh, actually, uh, this if statement is false. So a clever way of doing it is like this. So I do here my double loop over i and j, but without the boundary. So I start at 1 and I go up to nx minus 2, ny minus 2. And here I have no conditions at all, so I can just do my computation. And then separately, I take care of what happens at the boundary. So for instance, here is the code for the lower boundary. So j is 0 and i goes from 1 to nx minus 1. And then you do it for the other boundaries and the corners. So the code is not as pretty to look at because you have more cases, but it is much faster. So I think I gained a factor of 1.5 using this. And another trick is to optimize the parallel update because remember we had this u at time n plus 1 that depends on u at time n and n minus 1. So we don't need to keep in memory all the past evolution that would uselessly take a lot of memory. So you only need to take track of the wave heights at the two previous times. But this means that you have to do a parallel update. So you have to keep somehow the wave at times n minus 1 and n, and then compute the new wave values at time n plus 1. But then you have to shift 
time back. So the wave at time n plus 1 should become the wave at time n, and the wave at time n should become the wave at time n minus 1. And if you do it in a naive way, what you would do is just that. So first you compute the new value, and then you shift everything one unit back in time. So, so there's one first improvement uh, that was uh, given to me by uh, my colleague Marco Mancini, which is to take actually several tables. So here phi and psi in my code are the tables of wave values at time, uh, so the current time and the previous time. And then you get two new tables, which are temporary values, and evolve wave half is a function that does the time step, so it takes, so it computes the new values phi tmp psi tmp in terms of the old values phi and psi. And then you do the same thing again, where uh, you now compute the new values phi and psi in terms of these uh, temporary va values. And that is a good thing because you actually do two time steps and you don't need to shift the values. And at some point, uh, Julian Koth found an, an even better way of doing this with three different uh, tables. So you have tables phi and psi and, and then another table. So first you compute just the new value at time n plus 1 in terms of the values at time n and n minus 1. And then you cyclically shift this in three steps. And so you have no sh no shifting of the values at all to do. And, okay, while this first uh, trick gave me an acceleration factor of 2, this gave me actually almost 1.5 acceleration. So you see that by coding these things in a more clever way, you can uh, actually save a lot of computation time. All right, so that's all for today. So I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching and see you again soon. I hope. Take care. Bye.